sit in silence I sit in silence everyone is stalking everyone is stalking as I sit in silence there's an elephant in the room hello so we're back uh, once again um, uh, chapter uh, chapter uh, video number seven uh, in, in this series. Uh, so we're back in video number seven today. Thank you and welcome back. Uh, remember, if this is your first time watching one of these videos, uh, remember, you got to go back to part one. Uh, they're not long. They're maybe an hour each. And so this is a series concerning the end days, the final sabbatical cycle of seven years, which was decreed by, by Gabriel from Yahweh, uh, by Yeshua Yahweh, uh, to Gabriel, uh, to Daniel, decreeing the last seven years, the sabbatical cycle of seven, which is the last seven years before the return of our Lord Yeshua, between, uh, between, uh, concerning the return of our Lord Yahweh, Yahweh the Son, which is Yeshua HaMashiach, okay? He is King of the universe, creator of all things. So welcome to... Uh, video number seven uh, of a series. Uh, I don't know how many are going to be in this series, but welcome back uh, as we go through this uh, hour or so. Um, we left off just to do a recap on the uh, Raymond Ibrahim and the history concerning the Ottoman Empire. We're going through Ezekiel chapter 38 all the way to 48. We're not done with that. OK, but this is something that I, 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 I went through because of the first beginning chapters in 38 and 39 uh, concerning the first uh, who brings out that army from the north. Uh, just to do a recap, who brings them down? And that is Yahweh himself uh, because of his namesake, because uh, his name being profaned. And, and so he establishes himself so all nations will know that he is in charge. He is the, the creator of the universe. His name is Yahweh. He is our God. He is our king, king of the universe, creator of all things. He is the son, Yeshua, him and the father, the son, the Holy Spirit is one. They have always been one. Okay, so three in one. Okay, so we pick it up. We pick it up there in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, which goes through uh, the beginning of the middle of the seven weeks, the, the abomination that causes desolation, as we read in, in uh, Revelation and also in the book of Daniel, uh, that final seven years. And so we went through all these subjects, these things. You would have to go back if this is the video that you have picked up on, maybe the first time. Go back to video number one, and we went through the series. Uh, today, we're going to go ahead and pick it up where we left off. Now, we're going to go through those chapters uh, 40 through uh, 40 through 48, the remainder of Ezekiel. Uh, and so we're, we'll be getting to those, okay? We're going to be talking about the feast days. We're going to be talking about how good they are, the Sabbath, and how very important His commandments are, and how Yeshua did not abolish His commandments. He, he actually uh, confirmed His laws, okay? He confirmed. In the original Hebrew, it says He confirms His law. He establishes it. He confirms it. He does never say that He has done it and and then that we don't need to do it. No, his laws are perfect and precious. And we're going to be reading the millennial kingdom. These chapters, chapter 40 through 48, all have to do with precise, precise uh, um, descriptions on what it's going to look like. I'm talking about those of you who are carpenters or architects or engineers can actually take these measurements and you could actually make a model. I, I would like to see that. Okay, I do see it digitally, digitally, digitally uh, on 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 the web on 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 the internet because there has been those who have done it uh, actually on the internet uh, by by this artwork they do. You know, they measured it out. They give us models of it, how it's going to look. And because he gives us such a description. But engineers could go out there and maybe make a mini model of this. That would be amazing. A mini model, just like they have in Israel. They have the old temple and everything in it. Well, they should make a model of this, you know, by the measurements. And it would just be amazing to do a mini model of this. 
And so uh, others have done it. Maybe it's already been done. But that's how precise the measurements are, the details of the millennial kingdom on earth. And it says Yahweh will be standing, standing. I'm talking if he stands, then that has to be with feet, <laughs> okay? And so this is Yahweh the Son, Yahweh the King. He is one. Yahweh the Father, he is all one, okay? He is one. Yeshua, Abba Father, he is one, okay? And so he will be standing in this temple, and it says it, okay? And so we're going to be reading that briefly going over. We're not going to read the whole thing. That's a lot of reading, but I highly suggest that you do. Okay, do you go ahead and read it? And I'm going to briefly go through it when we get to that video. And I'm going to point these things out, how wonderful it is and who the prince is, uh, the prince that is there with him. Uh, we know that uh, it's it might be David, right? <laughs> yes, because we have scriptures that say it is. But Yahweh himself will be standing in the temple here on earth. Okay, here on earth as it is in heaven. That millennial kingdom will be built. All the tribes of Israel. We're going to be reading that, going over it, and what will be, what will be, what we. Huh, I'm sorry. What will we be celebrating? The feast, the feast of Passover in Leviticus chapter 23. The feast of Sukkot. That's just, it. Says it right there in Scripture. The new moons every week. I mean every month. The new moon celebrations, blowing the shofar. And also the Sabbaths, okay? So we're going to be bringing you all this, okay? We're not done here. We're, we're getting past the doom and gloom, okay? Almost past it, okay? The warnings, the warnings by Yahweh himself, okay? We're getting almost past it so we can start rejoicing in these videos now, okay? Because we're going to be talking about the millennial kingdom. And that's, yes, we, we long for that day, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. That's just the plain truth, okay? And so this is why we preach the gospel of the good news, okay? About going back and following his beautiful commandments, okay? And so we pick it up. Thank you if you've been following along. And so um, this is video seven. My name is David once again. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and read you. I brought you this article uh, which recently came out when er er Recep Erdogan was nominated as president again. And I kind of, you know, say, well, come on, you know, it was it, it was bound to happen because he is ruler over all things there in Turkey. Uh, in other words, he bought out everything. Uh, and so lo and behold, on May 29th, on that day, they celebrate Constantinople. That is the day that he won the elections. It just so happens that that was the day, okay, that he set it up. <laughs> I believe very much so, but that was the day. And so that he won the elections. And so uh, very, very, and so this right here is the president. I didn't read the article and forgive me, but I just showed you because of the fact about what he says about signing deals with the surrounding nations uh, in scripture, the warnings that Yahweh himself tells Israel time and time again. And we read from uh, Daniel chapter 9 about that last covenant, about the signature, the signing of that last covenant made with many by the Antichrist himself. So that's what's going to start the last seven years, okay? And so this I'm not saying is that. This I'm not saying is that. But this is just a handshake uh, just to waken you up, because we already talked about the revival of the Ottoman Empire and the atrocities they do. Well, this is his ideology and uh, his his daughter, the same thing. And she says the crosses will be broken in the West. OK, that that day is going to come. And so it is it's something that they believe is truly good. Uh, the God that they serve, they truly think they're doing a good, a good thing for God. OK, and so remember the feud between Jacob and Esau. All right. So here we go. This is the handshake by the president, the Israeli president, Isaac Herzog. OK, uh, I'm, I apologize once again. I didn't read the article and I'm just going to briefly read the article right here. Maybe a couple of these paragraphs. It says, uh. Israeli President Isaac Herzog. Now, remember, this is what you call politically correct. It's like when a president is nominated, they call each other, okay, to congratulate each other. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong at all with that. 
okay, as long as there's no contracts being signed, okay, in the eyes of God, in the eyes of Yahweh, okay, don't be deceived. And so, um, is there anything wrong with with uh, Netanyahu calling and, and, and telling them, celebrating and saying congratulations? No, because this is what they do. The different nations, they get nominated. I'm sure uh, uh, Erdogan called uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu when he was elected back and he congratulated him. This is how they, they, they work amongst each other. Because, yes, do they want peace? Of course, Benjamin Netanyahu wants peace. That's what all Israel wants is peace. It's like so long. They've been going at it for so very long. I'm talking, but they know the ideology and hopefully they know the prophecies. Uh, that is, this is all going to come to a, a fruition. It's all going to come when our Yahweh, our father is going to return and he's going to set up and establish his kingdom in Israel. That is prophetic. And I'm sure they know this. Okay, maybe they don't see it the same way as we, placing their faith in Yeshua as their Lord and Savior, placing, and this is what we pray for, the salvation of Israel, okay, for them to place uh, uh, their faith in Yeshua, who is Yahweh that came to this earth and he was crucified, okay, so we spread the good news, we pray that more Jews, our brothers and sisters, would come to faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, okay, before this last seven years, okay, and that they will not be deceived, okay, and so remember, we have a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God that you would, would, would if you repent of your sins, and you place your faith in him, he is, he is there to receive you, he's always been there, he's always spoken this through his prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all of them, they would always offer, he would always also offer grace for breaking his commandments, his laws, for walking away from his ways. He has always been there with an open arm saying, come on, just follow my ways. They're not a burden. They're not heavy yoke. They're easy to do. And we saw this in Yeshua, which followed all the commandments of Yahweh. Okay. And he, he showed that it wasn't hard to do. Okay. It, they're full of love. They're full of comp uh, uh, compassion and mercy. They're, they are very good for us, and, and, and it's just amazing. All his ways are true and right. And so we pick it up here, and uh, we go ahead and shish. Uh, I'm going to read this. This is, just came out the other day on March 9th. This was 2022. Uh, actually, this is an old picture, but this article was written on May 30th. Okay, 2023, not just the other day. Okay, just the other day. And so just give me a give me a quick second. Okay, so yes, uh so yes, uh May 30th, this was written. Uh May 30th, 2023. This is when this article was written. Uh once again, this is Israeli President Isaac Herzog. I uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, and and his Turkish counterpart, Recep. Tayyip Erdogan, er, Erdogan uh, shake hands during a press conference in Ankara, Turkey, March 9, 2022. So that's when this happened. Okay, so just recently, though, um, it says Israel's President Isaac Herzog and Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu were quick to call Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan on Monday to congratulate him on his electoral victory expressing their hope for further deepening relations between the two countries. The calls from Israel were ahead of Washington and some European capitals, okay? And so I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to leave these links to these articles in the description box, okay, so you could read them for yourselves. But once again, the presidents always do this. United States presidents, different presidents from different nations and countries, they call each other. You know, they're on that level. They all know each other. Okay. And they get together, they talk and uh, try to create as much peace as they can. But we know the only one when true peace comes, shalom, that is going to be brought by Yahweh himself. And we're reading this in the book of Ezekiel. He is going to take care of the Antichrist beast, that military force. He is going to come and establish his kingdom on earth that brings true peace. He is the he is the prince of peace, okay? And he will be the only one to bring peace in all the nations of the earth. The governments will rest upon his shoulders. So no, no human nation will bring that on this earth. No human nation will bring that themselves. That in itself 
Don't be deceived. There might be a, a sense of peace, okay, brought by the Antichrist, a sense of peace in the Middle East, but don't be deceived because true peace will come when our Lord and our Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, 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 Yahweh, is here on earth with us. That's when true peace will happen. And all the nations will be living according to his laws and his commandments in peace, in love. And there will be survivors, okay? Uh, and we'll go to, their, to, the, to those scriptures, I believe, right now within this hour. So I just wanted to bring you that. This is what's going on lately, okay? And so uh, we go ahead and uh, we go on to the next. Remember, I was bringing you the website by by um, by Raymond Ibrahim. Now I'm gonna remember I mentioned to you the first uh, military victory, uh, America. Okay, and many of you don't know this, and this is a fact. Okay, I did, I forgot the name of this war, but it was the Barbary War. Okay, this is also in his book. Okay, uh, the Barbary War. You can look it up in different places. Okay. The Barbary War in Islamic Terrorism and America's First Military Victory. Okay, you, excuse me, you might not have known this. I sure didn't. Okay, and so America's First Military Victory. This is a while back. This is why we thank our soldiers, the veterans that actually fought for our rights. Remember, Judeo-Christianity came by Christopher Columbus. That is also mentioned in this book, okay? Because he escaped from all the, 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 the heresies, all the atrocities that were happening in Spain and all these places where the Ottoman Empire was just cr crash. They were just crushing, raping, making slaves. So he escaped to the Americas. And this is Christopher Columbus. That is a fact also, okay? And he was a believer. He was a Messianic believer. He believed in Yeshua, okay? And so he was a Judeo-Christian. This is why America is based on Judeo-Christian Judeo values and, and the commandments, the Ten Commandments and so forth. Even though there's been a great separation, replacement theology, this is true facts, okay? And so we've gone a long ways, farther and farther from God, and God is calling the United States the United States to come back, okay, to those ways that Christopher Columbus came, okay, and, and, and stood for, and our military fought for, okay? And lo and behold, check this out. The Barbary War, Islamic terrorism, and America's first military victory, okay? So I'm just going to read briefly here, and then we'll continue to the next article. It says, many Americans erroneously trace the roots of Islamic terrorism against their nation to September 11th, 2001. We know the towers, right? The Twin Towers. Once again, many Americans erroneously trace the roots of Islamic terrorism against their nation to September 11th, 2001. In reality, the United States' uh, very first conflict with Muslim terrorists was also its very first war as a nation. And it won victory right on. That war, that war 213 years ago, today, this was on June 10th, 1805, okay? So he wrote this article on June 10th, okay? But 213 years ago, on June 10th, 1805, okay, we had victory against Islam. Okay, and now look what's become of our universities. I'm not going to get into all that. Okay, but look what happened at the Twin Towers. We don't learn our lesson, right? And so the same ideology. So remember this and just, just be careful, okay? And so pray for them. Remember, they are good. They're just in bondage and they don't think they're in bondage. Remember, they actually think they're doing good. And they just want peace also. This is why so many are seeing this. They're seeing the atrocities. They don't want to have nothing to do with those atrocities. They're seeing how evil it is. So many are converting because they're realizing who Yeshua is, who Yahweh is, how full of love he is, how compassionate he is. And so they're falling in love and they're converting. 
but they face a lot of dire consequences for doing so from their own leaders and their own nations, okay? Even some, their own families. This is the truth. And so I just wanted to, we'll leave it there. It's called um, the Barbary Wars, okay? And it gives you detail what happened there. Very interesting article. So I, I, I recommend that you go and check this out. Okay. Remember, I'll leave the link in the description box and you can check out all these things also in the book itself. Okay. And so I didn't know that. But yes, there is a lot of things that we don't know. Okay. Concerning that last end time beast. And, and remember, we're going through Ezekiel 38 and 39. This is what led me to share these things. Okay. And so there you have it there. Uh, also, Jihad Unleashed on Malta. That is also in the same book. Okay. And uh, we know that with Malta. So there you go. Have it there. Uh, today in uh, history, May 18th, 1565. One of the most symbolically important military encounters between Islam and Europe. Islam and Europe. The Ottoman Turks besieged the tiny island of Malta in what was then considered the heaviest bombardment any local had been subjected to. Okay, so we have that. Uh, so much, so much. This is all from the Ottomans, uh, Ottoman Empire. Okay, and we went through that on the maps. Okay, Gog of Magog. Okay, today in history, a Christian mustard seed delivers Spain from Islamic tyranny. Spain, if you didn't know, was also, okay, taken over by the Ottomans. Okay, by the Turks. Okay, they were outspread. Remember, I showed you the map of the Ottoman Empire. It was very big. They dominated and crushed a lot, all the way from Spain east and to the west, north, south. It was humongous. And this is what he wants to reestablish, okay? So, um, we have it there today in history on May 28th, 722. An immensely decisive battle between Christians and Muslims took place in Spain. A clash that, as shall be seen, is taking on renewed significance. Eleven years earlier, in 711, hordes of North African Muslims, Moors, godlessly invaded Spain to destroy it. To quote from the Chronicle of 754, they did not pass a place without reducing it and getting possession of its wealth. Boasted Al-Hakam, an early Muslim chronicler, for Allah Almighty has struck with terror the hearts of the infidels. And so you can go ahead and read that. Uh, just continue to read that. And um, if you want, I'll leave this, this also, this link in the description box, okay? All right. Uh, Enigma solved. Egypt's persecuted Christians many times more than officially reported. Now, also, Egypt is being persecuted. Uh, all this news is brought to you by this website and also many other websites. Um, I'm going to be bringing you a couple of other things here. Uh, Open Door Ministries, you can go there to that website and see what's going on. Voice of the Martyrs, persecution.org. Uh, and so many other outlets that you can go to to look what's going on right now, real time in the Middle East. OK. All right. So. Um, Egypt's pretty. OK, so Egypt is being persecuted. Uh, you could go through this article. Christian denominations, Christians of all denominations account for about only 14 percent of Egypt's entire population or roughly 15 million of the nation's. 105 million so are they are they is it okay for them to be christians yes but in other words the government and everything in them is kind of votes them out like they try to build a church and they really they have a hard time doing it because so many mosques are there okay so this is how they deal with them and so they are pushed down okay uh, and also a lot of abductions of Christian young girls, okay, happen in Egypt. A lot of oppression to the Coptic Christians, once again. So another um, detailed article that you can read. 
And so we go back to, right now we're going to go back to Ezekiel. And we're going to continue in Ezekiel uh, chapter 38. Uh, and I want to bring you, I told you I was going to be bringing you uh, also Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, just before I go there, I just want to uh, read Open Door Ministries. If you want to go to Open Door Ministries, they have a world watch list, okay, of all the persecution that is happening in all those nations. And I'm just going to read off the list here of high hostile. Uh, I'm talking very high persecution going on. And they'll send you a map, okay. They will send you a map and... And in this map, they'll let, they'll let you know the extreme persecution so you know who to pray for. Now, every year they do send a map, Open Door Ministries. Uh, number one is Afghanistan on the list, number one. Uh, North Korea, number two. Somalia, three. Libya, four. Yemen, five. Eritrea, six. Nigeria, seven. Uh, Pakistan, uh, number eight. Iran, Number nine, India, number 10, and Saudi Arabia, number 11. Now, it has 50, okay? I'm not going to read through all the 50, but if you want to go and know who to pray for, the top 11 are extreme persecution. The ones I just read you, those are extreme persecution that is going on. I'm talking violent persecution. Now, go to this. It's called the World Watch List at Open Door Ministries, and uh, check that out. Check that out. So you know what to pray for. Our brothers and sisters who are placing their faith in Yeshua, this is what they go through. Okay, And the other ones are at a lower uh, persecution level, but those first top 11 are extreme. So I just wanted to bring you that before we continue. Thank you. We always pray for our persecuted and oppressed brothers and sisters. So now we're going to go ahead and go to Zechariah chapter 14. Okay. Now, this Zechariah 14 coincides with uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. It coincides. Remember, I can bring you so many other cross references, and maybe I will in later parts of the series, but for right now, I'm keeping it limited to Zechariah, Joel chapter 2, and the book of Revelation. We'll go through a, a few spots in Revelation, but just so we'll have scripture that backs up scripture, okay? Two witnesses, if you want to say. So we got Zechariah 14. And this, once again, this is talking about the same events that we're reading in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Okay. More or less, um, the middle of the Great Tribulation. This is where this picks up in Zechariah 14. And it also speaks of the Millennial Kingdom in Zechariah 14. And it also speaks of, remember I told you there will be survivors. And maybe many of you don't understand this. And this this is going to explain as we start reading chapters 40 of Ezekiel about the millennial kingdom and the sacrificial system, the priest of Zadok. Why is there going to be sacrifices going on? Why are they going to be doing this? If Yahweh, uh, Yeshua will be right there in the temple, because there's going to be a lot of survivors. Remember, they don't have the resurrected bodies yet. They have a choice to believe or not. Now, the Bible is silent on if they receive their resurrected bodies once they believe. I truly believe that because then they'll enter into the new heavens, new earth by what tribe they've been grafted into when they come to believe. And now we're going to read this right now. And also we're going to read this in, in the book of, of Ezekiel chapter 40 and, and, and forward. We're going to be reading this about the sacrificials, and this will answer a lot of those questions. Why is he going to be sacrificing again? Animals, why are they going to be sacrificed? Why is it going to be blood sacrifices? Remember, he's going to bring all that back. This is his laws. Remember, he did not come to abolish his laws. And you're probably thinking, well, you know, no, none of them. 
because here on earth as it is in heaven. But the thousand year millennial reign here on earth will come to an end. You say, what? Not, I didn't say the kingdom. No. And the law won't be needed either after the thousand year reign. Remember, there will be survivors. So that answers that question. Why the law? Why in the millennial kingdom? Okay, so separate. He's still having grace and mercy upon those survivors. We're going to be reading that right now. Okay, so he's going to, his mercy endures forever. He wishes that none would perish. And then that seventh day will end. Satan will be let loose for a while. It's all scripture in the book of Revelation, chapter uh, 20, 21, 22. We find that chapter 19, after the thousand years, he'll be let loose. Then comes the white throne judgment. Then he judges Satan, all the demons. And then he judges all those that didn't want to believe, all those that have died and partake in the second death. He will judge them according to what they have done in their lives. This is why salvation is so very important. You do not want to be a part of the second death. You do not want to be a part of that. You want to be in the first resurrection. You want to be in the kingdom on earth, in the millennial kingdom. That's where you want to be. And remember, today is the day of salvation. Because if you're to die today, regardless if you go through the great tribulation, regardless if you're living at that time, if you die today without Yeshua, without Christ, Messiah, and placing your faith in him, then guess what? You'll be a part of the great white throne judgment, the second death. This is what you do not want. So today is the day of salvation. Today. And so Zechariah 14. Behold, a day of Yahweh comes when your plunder will be divided within you. This is the invasion. Okay, this is Jacob's trouble. This is the same, remember, coincides with Ezekiel 38 and 39. Behold, a day of Yahweh comes, when your plunder will be divided within you. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Remember the nations, the north? Remember, he puts it in their mind, to, to, to an evil thought to go up. He brings them down out of the, the north, as we're reading in Ezekiel 38. So this is that right there. Verse 2 says, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem, and many more, he said. Remember, it's going to be Ezekiel and many more. Well, uh, I'm sorry. It will be uh, a Gog of Magog and many more, it says. That, that, that army that he brings down from the north, he puts a hook in their jaw and he brings them down. He will be leading this Antichrist army. Okay, and so... For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken. The city will be taken. The houses rifled, and the women ravished. Remember we were reading what the Ottomans did. Remember what we were reading, the M.O., the same M.O. This was different than the Romans. The Romans, you don't hear that type of history of them doing that. But you do read it in the Ottoman Empire and the wars that they had. Ravaging the women, that means raping them. Okay, so we have that same MO right here. It says, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken. The houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city will go out into captivity. And the, and the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then Yahweh will go out and fight against those nations. In the first, it tells you right here. This backs up scripture in Ezekiel, the same thing. It says, then verse 3, Yahweh will go out and fight against those nations. This is what we're reading in Ezekiel 39. As when he fought in the day of battle, his feet will stand in on that day on the Mount of Olives. Now, many do not say this, but this is when he stands on the Mount of Olives. 
Now, it skips a lot here, right? Right? But this is Ezekiel 38, 39, which gives you more detail. And we're going to be going into Joel 2 right now. Then Yahweh will go out and fight against those nations. Amen. As when he fought in the day of battle, his feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives. Whose feet? Yahweh, the Son, Yahweh, his feet. It's talking about Yahweh here. And that's another thing. I love this translation here. Okay? We are reading right now Zechariah, and it says, Who will stand there? Yahweh. It's like, wait a minute here. Yahweh. Yes. Yahweh will stand there. Some of your translators will say, The Lord. Who is the Lord? It is Yahweh. Who is Yahweh? He's the Son. Yahweh the Son. Okay, so he's always been king of the universe, creator of all things. So it says, then Yahweh will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west. The great earthquake, remember, making a very great valley, the same valley that is spoken of in Ezekiel. Half of the mountain will move towards the north and half of it towards the south. You shall flee by the, the valley of my mountains. Once again, my mountains, he says. He said the same statement in Ezekiel. My mountains. I will bring them to my mountains. Okay, so he is establishing that it's his Okay, all right, so it says, For the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azel. Yes, you shall flee, just like you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Yahweh my God will come, and all the holy ones with you. It will happen in that day that there will not be light, cold, or frost. It will be a unique day, which is known to Yahweh. Not day and not night, but it will come to pass that at evening time there will be light. <laughs> it will happen in that day that living waters will go out from Jerusalem. This is the rejoicing part. Now you can rejoice. The doom and gloom at this point is over. Okay, we're going into the day of atonement. Okay, which is Yom Kippur. Okay, we're going into the wedding feast. Okay, now you can rejoice right here. It will happen in that day that living waters will go out from Jerusalem. Beautiful. Half of them towards the eastern sea and half of them towards the western sea. It will be so in summer and in winter. Yahweh will be king over all the earth. Hello, what? <laughs> Yahweh will be king over all the earth. He already is king. He has always been king. Before the foundations of the earth, he has always been king of the throne. Remember this. He will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be one. And his name, one. I love that. Once again, let me highlight that. Yahweh will be king over all the earth. In that day, Yahweh will be one because he is one. Can he be in two places at the same time? Yes, through his rule HaKodesh, he could be in all believers all around the earth at one time. He's omnipresent, but he's three and one. He is one, king of the universe, creator of all things. And his name is one. Verse 10 all the land will be made like the Arabah, from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. And she will be lifted up and will dwell in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate to the corner gate. And from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. Once again, this description fits the description in Ezekiel that we're going to be going through uh, 40 through 48. Okay, so men will dwell therein. We're talking about the millennial kingdom. Men will dwell therein, and there will be no more curse. Remember, he restores all things back to Eden. No more curse on the ground. Even the ground cries out. He's going to restore it. It's cursed, the ground. It's cursed, okay? And so, but Jerusalem will dwell safely. No more. That's This is truly no more. When I talked about shalom, peace, the prince of peace, this is Yahweh. 
This is when he establishes himself in his Jerusalem, on his throne, which was the throne of David. Remember this. He will sit on that throne forever, here on earth as it is in heaven, and then into the millennial, uh, into the new heavens, new earth. And we'll get there, okay? Uh, just, just let me get through this. We'll get there, uh, whether it be in this video or maybe another one. Men will dwell therein, and there will be no more curse, but Jerusalem will dwell safely. Finally, finally, no more IDF needed. Truly, truly, not a false sense of peace, but our Lord, our Lord Yahweh Yeshua will be there, right there with us. This will be the plague. Here we go. This will be the plague with which Yahweh will strike all the peoples, who have fought against Jerusalem. Er, wait a minute, let's park it there. Survivors, those who have fought against Jerusalem. Look at the mercy and the love of our Father. Yes, does he take out that jihadist, that, 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 that beast army? Yes, he does. Does he bound Satan for a thousand years? Yes, he does. Even that. No more demons, no more unclean spirits to bother us. No more. No more. Glorious. Hallelujah. Amen. No more. What a time to rejoice. But there will be survivors that didn't, didn't believe, but they, he allows them to survive. And this is what one of our job descriptions will be to, to, to help them. So that they'll learn, so that they'll know Yahweh himself, the sacrificial system for them. And then the, at the ending of the thousand years, they will all be hopefully repentant, all of them. But he will, with an iron scepter, he will, his laws will go forth. And you might as well start getting used to it now. The, I'm talking about the feast days. I'm talking about the Sabbath, the new moon. Those are commandments. The law, it will go forth from Zion. And all nations, all knees will bow. It talks about them right here, the survivors from the nations, the ones that fought against Jerusalem. This will be the plague. There will be plagues. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't, I want to chuckle. But if you don't, he's going to have his way so that his name will no longer be profaned. His ways are perfect, divinely spoken. This, verse 12, this will be the plague with which Yahweh will strike all the peoples who have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will consume away while they stand on their feet, and their eyes will consume away in their sockets. And their tongue will consume away in their mouth if, right, if it will happen in that day that a great panic from Yahweh will be amongst them because he's going to be right there. And they will each seize the hand of his neighbor and his hand will rise up against the hand of his neighbor. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered together, gold, silver, and clothing in great abundance. Remember what we're reading in the book, in, in, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 38. Remember I says they don't actually rob, they don't actually steal back, but they just get back what was taken from them. That's this right here. That is this. And we could go through that scripture in Ezekiel 38 again. If you weren't paying attention, he says they will, he will allow them to rob back what they plundered. Okay. But not like they're stealing and breaking one of his commandments. No, they're just taking it back what they took from Israel when they invade. Listen what it says here. Chapter 14. Judah will also fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered together. The surrounding nations, the one that came up against Israel and took and looted gold, silver, and clothing in great abundance. A plague like this will fall on the horse, on the mule, on the camel, on the donkey, and all the animals that will be in those camps. 
In other words, he's going he's gonna to send out a plague to teach them a lesson. Those who fought against him, but they won't die. They won't die. He was not gonna, he's not going to kill them. But you got to remember, these are the same ones that fought against Jerusalem. All the atrocities they did. All the looting. All the robbing, the stealing, the ravishing of the women. They're going to pay the price. But they got a choice to repent. In the millennial kingdom, they got a choice. I want you to read through these scriptures carefully. 16. It will happen that everyone who is left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths. So to all of you who say the feasts are done away with, who is Yahweh here? Who is Yeshua? Yeshua says he didn't come to abolish the laws. So we got this Feast of Booths coming up this fall. And I've been celebrating them every year now. I have repented. Because we're going to be doing it here. And if you choose not to, look at the warning. This is the Millennial Kingdom now. The Feast of Booths is Sukkot. This is the last of the fall feast. We're going to be reading this in Ezekiel. This is one of those that we continue to come up to Israel with Yahweh himself standing there in his temple. And he's saying, okay, all of you that didn't want to go along, didn't want to come up to celebrate, or didn't want to celebrate in your own homes, well, you're going to have to. You're going to have to. So you might as well get used to it. A dress rehearsal. He's watching all of us. He left us his precious laws, his ways that are perfect. And he wants us to follow them here on this earth. And then kingdom, the kingdom in heaven will meet earth. When heaven meets earth, this what we're reading right now. And it says it will happen that everyone who is left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths, Sukkot, tabernacles, the feast of tents, it's the same one, the last of the fall feast in Leviticus, the last feast day, you can read it in Leviticus chapter 23. The last feast day is called the Feast of Booths. Remember, it's prophetic. It's prophetic. All of Leviticus 23 is prophetic. And it's very important. Verse 17, it will be that whoever of all the families of the earth does not go up, doesn't go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, on them there will be no rain. I want to highlight that. Very important. I'm going to highlight this right here. It will be that whoever of all the families of the earth doesn't go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts. On them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt doesn't go up and doesn't come, Neither will it rain on them. This will be the plague with which Yahweh will strike the nations that don't go up to keep the Feast of Booths. Now you know why it says he rules with an iron scepter. Because he's going to put the nations in subjection for denying him. But this is mercy. He's not cruel. This is mercy. He's given Thousands of years here, 7,000, 6,000 to be precise, to follow his ways. The nations that surround Israel, talking from Mount Sinai, coming down himself, establishing, confirming his laws, and saying, follow me, follow my ways. 6,000 years. He attempted in every way possible grace throughout the whole earth. Grace. 
a time, a time. There's a limit of time that he has set. And then this will happen. You will not have a choice anymore unless you want to receive the plagues. But that's mercy on his part. He could just do away with every unbeliever, every nation, all those that came against Israel and his ways. And he could just take them all out. And in the kingdom, it's nothing but believers. No, he gives them a chance. What nations are these? Just the surrounding nations? No, there's many nations in all the earth. Many will survive. Those who choose not to come up to the kingdom. Verse 19. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that don't go up to keep the feast of Sukkot, the feast of Booths. And then in Ezekiel, we're going to be reading about the Passover. Once again, the new moons, the Sabbaths, all those that so very many, sadly, by replacement theology, think that we don't no longer have to do those things. Sadly, because this is here, right here, coming from the mouth of Yahweh, from the mouth of the prophets of Yahweh, from Yahweh himself in Ezekiel, that we will do those things. That we should be doing them right now. The best of our ability. The best we can. Can you celebrate the Feast of Booths wherever you live? Yes, you can. I have plenty of friends that do it. You can do it in your own backyard. In memory of. And you don't think he sees you when you do that? You build a little tabernacle and you, you live in it maybe in a tent? which many gather together and they live in tents. They go camping. They make little tents for seven days. You don't think Yahweh sees that and honors it? The best of our ability. You don't have to be in the land to do this. Remember, we've been grafted in wherever you live in the entire earth. Remember Paul. He sent out Gentile nations. He sent out to the church of Colossus. Very important. We're we'll going to that scripture. Let me write it down so I can, I don't have to continue to tell you. Maybe we'll go there in the last few minutes of this video. And then we'll finish up this right here. Verse 19. This will be the punishment of Egypt. And the punishment of all the nations that don't go up to keep the Feast of Booths. What was that? Egypt and what? The punishment of all the nations. So what are all the nations considered? If you're not in the land of Israel, where this is his Israel, the Holy Land, all every other nation is every other nation outside of Israel, which is the entire earth. All the nations around the earth will fall in line. They will do it. Or else, it's it's not my words, it's his words. I'm just reading his words. So if you have a problem with this, I, I hope you don't. I really hope you don't. But take it up with him. Pray to him. Ask him, is this true, Abba? Is this true, Yahweh? Ask him, do you want me to keep the feast? Scripture says that, yes, you do. He does. Yeshua says, follow me. He did all the feast. He was there since a childhood up. You answer that question. You go to him. I'm just a messenger, a mouthpiece. Hoping for repentance and true unity amongst the brethren. <clears throat> and so this will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that don't go up to keep the Feast of Booths. In that day, there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to Yahweh and the pots in Yahweh's house, 
will be like the bowls before the altar. Amazing. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah, remember, they're going to be back together, the southern and northern kingdom, restored back together. The 144,000 have a lot to do with that. A pure 12 tribes of Israel back together again. The two houses back together in one house. Whose house? Yahweh's house. Back together in unity. The 12 disciples, right there, all believers, are grafted in. Oh, it's going to be amazing. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to Yahweh of hosts, and all those who sacrifice will come and take of them. Sacrifice and cook in them. In that day, there will be, there will no longer be a Canaanite, in other words, or a merchant in the house of Yahweh of hosts. Okay. Oh my goodness. This is amazing. And we're coming up. I would like to continue, but we're coming up on the last five minutes of this video. Okay. And so um, I'm going to be bringing you I got one minute to take you to Colossians, and then we're going to be bringing you on the next video. We'll start Joel chapter 2 that coincides a third witness. Joel chapter 2 of the same army, the same Antichrist army. Now, not only two witnesses, we're going to have three witnesses. And there's so many more. I, I haven't begun to go to the book of Revelation that confirm this very, very same thing. Okay, so in the next video, we're going to be starting with Joel chapter 2. But I'm going to take you right now, quickly, and we'll end this video, to the book of Colossians. Okay, so let's go, let's get there. And it's just a brief one. It's in the first chapter. And then, now read it carefully. So many take this paragraph out of context. It's towards the middle. Uh, forgive the barking. That's just my dog outside. <laughs> let me see if I can find it here. Uh, let me see. I know it's here. Oh, I, I'm speaking of an, <laughs> I was speaking of another. Oh, hold on. I, I feel kind of foolish because uh, in the middle of Colossia, I love this. This is the scripture I was thinking about, but it's not this part. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I'll be bringing you that in the next video. But this is a good one, though. This is very powerful. All those who know and think that he is not Yahweh. OK, uh, in other words, Yahweh, the son, Yeshua, Yahweh, Yeshua. That's his name, right? He is the image of the invisible God who is. You read it in the context, and it's talking about Yeshua, okay, Messiah Yeshua, okay? This context, read Colossians chapter 1, and I will find that scripture for you. I feel kind of foolish, but I will, okay, about the Sabbath, about, about being uh, judged by others not to keep those days, okay? And so, but this is just, just as powerful. So we're talking about Yeshua in the context. So he, who, Yeshua, Messiah, is the image of the invisible God, Yahweh Yeshua, the firstborn of all creation, of all creation. What? He's always been there. King of the universe. It's Yahweh. For by him, all things were created in the heavens. By who? By Yeshua, by Yahweh. Okay, Yeshua the Son. All things were by him. All things were created in the heavens and on the earth. Visible things and invisible things, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before, he is before all things, and in him all things are held together. He is the head of the body, the assembly, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, the resurrection, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For all the fullness was well pleased to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on the cross 
or things in the heavens, having made peace, shalom, that true police, that true peace I was talking about, shalom, through the blood of his cross. Amen. So um, I'm going to go ahead and leave you there. We're coming up on the hour. I will be bringing you that scripture, I promise you, in the next video, video number eight. So I love all of you. I hope you, you're enjoying this series that I'm making, going through the book of Ezekiel and so many other scriptures about the last final seven years, about the feast days, the importance of the Sabbaths, the importance of all the feast days that he very much wants us to celebrate and do. These are commandments, okay? And so thank you so very much. Remember, I'll bring that scripture to you in the book of Colossians, okay? I just couldn't get to it now by memory. I Please do forgive me. But this was a very important scripture also, right? So uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you go for now. And I will be back for the next video. Remember, I love all of you. Goodbye for now, but never forever. I sit in silence I sit in silence Everyone is stalking Everyone is stalking As I sit in silence There's an elephant in the 